ladies and gentlemen, my presentation, uh, The Looting of Germany, is a translation of the title of my latest book, uh, which in German is called Beuteland. Beuteland literally means uh, prey country. And of course, uh, Germany has an above average prey value because of its uh, location, of its geopolitical location in the middle of Europe, and because of its uh, resources and because of its uh, financial strength and, and str strong economy. The reason why I researched uh, the subject is, is twofold. Firstly, it is always a pleasure to question politically correct narratives. And in this case, it is uh, the history of post-war Germany up to this date, as it is called by German government, the German ruling class, and its Western allies. And it goes like this. Germany was liberated in 45. Then the victors introduced democracy in 1945. The Americans uh, gen uh, generously assisted Germany after the war and helped to rebuild the economy. Uh, Germany never paid reparations according to President Truman and the American ambas ambassador to uh, Bonn, or the narrative that there is no alternative to European integration and even to the European Union and to the EU, uh, to the Euro, and the narrative that the Euro um, is an enormous advantage for uh, Germany, and even that the Euro is a question of war and peace, and so forth. Now, secondly, I came across some astonishing statistics from the German Bundesbank and the European Central Bank, even the Euro, uh, Italian Central Bank, and all these statistics show that the Germans, the citizens are not particularly rich. In fact, the median assets of uh, German households are lower than their respective Italian ones. So, um, how, how can this be? I mean, one reason could be that uh, taxes and social security contributions are very high in Germany, nearly 50% of GNP compared to less than 15% uh, just before the First World War, uh, which, by the way, proves that uh, the monarchy was a much more liberal system than we have today. Um, and uh, 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 liberal as far as property and freedom are concerned. Another reason might be that Italians pay uh, less tax. Uh, they avoid paying, paying tax whenever possible. And so their shadow economy is very large. You only become rich by paying less taxes, of course. Now, the truth is that the German state has a triple rating. It is solvent. It is financially uh, sound, but only at the expense of German citizens and taxpayers. This is a very important point. Now, another explanation for this not very exciting uh, German wealth is uh, what you could call the looting of Germany. Uh, and this is my story. It was President uh, François Mitterrand 
And the editor of Le Figaro, French newspaper, who compared the Treaty of Maastricht, which, as you know, introduced the Euro in 1999, to the Treaty of Versailles, which concluded the First World War. And it was uh, the British historian Niall Ferguson who once said in an interview with uh, Der Spiegel, German weekly magazine, that German payments for European integration correspond to payments resulting from the Treaty of Versailles. By corresponding, he meant nearly as large. And I, if you don't mind, I quote the Greek philosopher Panayotis Kondulis, who once remarked, quote, you don't genuinely believe that anybody would be interested in German guilt if Germany had no money. <laughs> Now, to begin with, nobody talked of liberation in 1945. Nobody, except, of course, for the victims of the concentration camps. For instance, uh, I checked all memoirs uh, by politicians. For instance, Konrad Adenauer, the first chancellor of the Federal Republic, speaks in his memoirs of occupation, not of liberation. No. Or somebody like uh, Erhard Eppler, very well-known social democrat, remarked in a television interview, I didn't feel liberated. And he was, of course, a strong opponent, always, of Nazism and so on. And then there was the famous Directive JCS 10667, JCS for Joint Chiefs of Staff. This was signed by President Roosevelt in March 1945 uh, and laid down the guiding principles of the future policy of occupation in Germany. Now what is more interesting, paragraph four of this directive formulated uh, the thesis of collective guilt of the German people and stated, quote, Germany will not be occupied for the purpose of liberation, but as, as a conquered enemy nation, as a defeated enemy, na enemy nation. Now, ironically, Austria wa was treated uh, quite differently. In 1943, the Western Allies declared Austria to have been Hitler's first victim. And the victim had to be liberated, of course. I mean, liberation, of course, excludes collective guilt. If you are guilty and nasty and very bad, you are not liberated, but defeated. And in the Treaty of uh, 1955, the four powers renounced their uh, right to German property in Austria and handed it over to the Austrians. Now coming to paragraph 5 of the directive, directive, paragraph 5 forbade General Eisenhower to take any measures to rebuild the German economy. And Equally important, JCS 1067 defined the war booty, namely all assets of scientific and industrial research, trade secrets, patents, and so on. Now, what resulted from JCS 1067 was the biggest ever robbery of intellectual property in the history of mankind. Uh, John Gimbel, an American historian, has written a superb book on the subject titled Science, Technology and Reparations, 
exploitation and plunder in post-war Germany. I'll give you a few examples. In the Imperial, Imperial Patent Office in Berlin, Reichspatentamt, no? 70 Americans and Germans who had to assist them copied more than one million pages on 70 miles of microfilm. In Germany, practically everything of value, I mean as far as possible within three years, yeah, was systematically investigated and removed from universities, research institutes and uh, industrial companies and uh, taken to America in order to uh, be made available to uh, American companies. The Americans were very impressed. They were even impressed with uh, a German butter machine or a machine to wrap chocolates because they didn't have it in the same uh, quality. Uh, to quote uh, John Green, he was involved on the highest level as the director of the American Office of Technical Services. He wrote in May 47 that today's imports of German technology would be America's exports of tomorrow. And another official of the Ministry of Trade spoke of, quote, the biggest transfer of knowledge on a huge scale which has ever been executed from one country to another. Another official said German technology would save the American economy billions of dollars in the course of the next decades and advance American research by several years. And this was, of course, especially true for the chemical industry and even more so for uh, uh, airplanes and, and rockets, as you know. Now, responsible for this so-called uh, document program, it was called, was the Field Information Agency Technical, acronym FIAT. Fiat, founded by Eisenhower's Supreme Headquarters in uh, 45, and it concluded its work in 47. And then there was another project you have probably heard about, Project Paperclip, uh, sometimes called Project Overcast, uh, which organized the transfer of uh, German and, and Austrian uh, scientists to the United States, uh, up to 1,000 uh, persons. This was secret in the beginning in the United States, also in England, and when it came out, uh, the public was very angry because they said Nazis coming here to uh, America or to England and the funny thing is, the German scientists in England had to pay their taxes twice, in England and in Germany. Uh, but somebody like Werner von Braun um, was a former member of the National Socialist Workers' Party and of the SS. But this, they didn't care. Uh, he was vital for their rocket program. <clears throat> of course, it is impossible to, to quantify this kind of intellectual transfers, to quantify it financially, I mean. Uh, John Gimbel tried to do that, and he uh, arrived at a figure of $10 billion, which in today's money would be, this is, by the way, very difficult to uh, ascertain it would be between 10 and 20 times as much in today's uh, uh, money. But anyway, when you just compare the value of uh, one German company like uh, Siemens, uh, which um, on the stock exchange right now is worth 
95 bi billion uh, uh, euros. And if you take away from them, well, practically everything, their whole knowledge, their patents and everything, and hand it over to their competitor, how much would Siemens lose uh, in value? I think uh, one third would be not too, uh, too high, would be a conservative estimate. Now, if you add to this document program, to the intellectual reparations, the long list of other reparations, uh, excluding the dismantling of whole industrial plants, which only ended in 1951 in West Germany. Um, dismantling of industrial plants, forced exports of coal and other goods. For instance, uh, coal was prime energy, of course, in these times, not oil. Uh, Germany had to sell their coal, which they needed desperately, really, uh, to foreign countries for um, um, uh, $10 per ton, whereas the world market price was around 25. And many other things. Uh, or if you count the costs of occupation. For instance, in 1948, yeah, uh, Occupation in uh, West Germany, in the three West German zones, absorbed one third of tax revenue in West Germany. In to today's values, that would be more than 200 billion euros. In today's, comparing it to today, today's uh, tax revenues, more than 200 billion. Uh, uh, euros. So you, you get an idea of, of the enormous price the Germans paid for losing the war. And I didn't mention the Russians and the French, uh, whose occupation was much harsh, harsher than the Americans and, and uh, the American and the British occupation. <coughs> Ah, and I, I nearly forgot the expropriation of private property, of German foreign private property, uh, which according to one cal calculation in 1952 amounted to 18 billion Deutsche Mark, and according to other estimates between 20 and 30 billion uh, um, in Deutschmark of uh, the 50s, in today's purchasing power, that would be at least uh, 10 times as much. Um, now, don't understand me, don't misunderstand me. I do not argue against reparations per se. I mean, they, they are unavoidable if a country loses uh, a war. And when the war ends, yeah, uh, only then uh, it is stated who, who was guilty or not, uh, who has to pay or not. But anyway, uh, normally reparations are agreed upon in a peace treaty, like with Japan, like with the other European allies of uh, Germany in uh, 47, with very modest reparations. Uh, for instance, Japan, in, in their peace treaty, was only obliged to pay one billion dollars in reparations. So it's, it was handled completely different, differently from, uh, from the German uh, case. So in Germany's case, it was irregularly arbitrary plunder. Without bookkeeping, without bookkeeping, and this is the reason why uh, even the German government uh, does not know to this date how much has been taken away 
because there was no accounting. It was just, it was arbitrary. And of course, um, taking away private property is not allowed under international law. No. Um, that is just that is theft. theft. And uh, um, uh, later on, in a treaty uh, with the Western Allies, the Bonn government had to promise in 1954 that uh, it would never ask for restitution of private property and that German courts would not be allowed to hear such cases. Okay, now, as it turned out, the Germans were lucky. The wartime alliance collapsed, the alliance between the West and the uh, Soviet Union, the Cold War broke <coughs> out, and the U.S. Army started uh, pleading Germany's case, not the State Department, the Army, and um, America adopted a policy designed to uh, prevent Germany from staying a vacuum in the middle of Europe and, uh, and, uh, and being a soft spot for communist infiltration. So, in 1947, JCS 1067, the one which I quoted, uh, extensively was replaced by a new directive and this one was much more lenient, much more lenient. But even after 49, after the constitution of the new German state, uh, there were many restrictions on German industry which only ended in 55. And uh, I could give you a lecture now about uh, the Marshall Plan uh, which is always, that is also a myth. Uh, the Marshall Plan didn't rebuild the German economy. This was credit of 1.4 billion dollars. The French and the British got much, much more and uh, with less uh, effect. Um, so, and, and Ludwig Erhard, who is sadly, you know, forgotten in Germany today, Ludwig Erhard, yeah. even in the 60s he warned against the uh, Euro and the European Union how it evolved later, but, but he saw, saw it coming. Yeah. And Ludwig Erhard once said, uh, the German uh, Wirtschaftswunder, economic miracle, was achieved by us solely not by a credit of uh, 1.4 billion dollars who had to be um, repaid um, mo mo uh, nearly entirely. All right. Now, 55 brought the end of formal occupation in Germany. Uh, Germany didn't become a sovereign state. This was only the case in 1990 with the four plus, two plus four treaty. And so uh, Germany became an American satellite, which it still is today to a certain extent. Now the problem for Angela Merkel is that she's still not sure where the real power lies in Washington with Donald Trump or with the East Coast establishment. So um, I think she still, seem, she, she still bets on, on the deep state. Um, but we will see um, how it turns out. Now, I'm going to spare you the other billions of reparations and other payments. Uh, most of them voluntarily in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. I also mentioned the 90s because Germany paid an enormous sum for the Iraq war, for a war which they uh, didn't want, they didn't want to take part. They thought uh, 
um, it would be the wrong war, yeah, which was the case, as, as we know. But anyway, they were forced to pay a very high sum for the Iraq war. Well, instead, I'm going to leap to European integration and uh, to the European Monetary Union, which started in 99. And I'm referring to the German role as, as European paymaster, uh, which is, by the way, often misunderstood as a form of German hegemony. But this is not true. Uh, I think it was Alain Mink, the French uh, who, Frenchman who once said, uh, Germany has no power. Uh, and I sometimes wonder about what the whole EU would look like if everybody had to pay their own bills. Uh, then it would be a completely different animal. Well, as you know, every European state pays into uh, the common, uh, to, into the uh, Brussels budget. And, um, and now, when a government gets back more than it pays in, yeah? it is a net recipient of subsidies. And when it gets back less, uh, it is a net contributor. And there are two methods of calculating net contributions, but uh, I won't bother you uh, with this. In any case, a certain part of national expenditure always flows from Brussels which doesn't make sense because uh, bureaucracy costs are deducted, then a lot of money is misused uh, or prone to corruption, and because a local uh, bureaucrat would know better how to spend money than a bureaucrat in, in Brussels. For instance, in uh, 2014, uh, Germany paid uh, uh, 28.8 billion euros into the European budget and got back 11.5, uh, double the amount. Uh, so the, the net uh, figure uh, is uh, 17.5 billion, uh, double the amount of 2009. Of course, Germany could have avoided all the hassle and uh, the complicated money flows back and forth by just paying 17.5 billion into the budget. Then in Brussels, they would have less work to do. And what is more important, <coughs> all these signs uh, with the inscription co-financed by the European Union, which you can see all over Germany, uh, would be unnecessary. When you confront a German politician with, uh, with, these, uh, with Germany being paymaster, they always say, well, we get a lot of money out, uh, out of Brussels. But they don't do the whole calculation. Yeah. And a lot of people believe them. Well, it's wonderful. Uh, you get money from Brussels. Yeah. You give them five, you get back three, for instance. <laughs> Uh, well, to cut a long story short, uh, Germany has been the European paymaster from the beginning. Um, and that is why Niall Ferguson uh, went so far as to speak of a mutually agreed system of war reparations. And the figures I, uh, I, um, I'm going to tell you now um, have been... Um, investigated by Professor Willeke and myself uh, for, for several, for, for all relevant time periods. Um, and we had to do it because uh, these figures are normally not available. Anyway, from 1976 to 1990, Germany financed 60% of the uh, European Transfer Union. Uh, you could as well call it ETU instead of uh, EU. And the others, just 
And what is interesting, in the years immediately after reunification, after 1999, Germany paid net 73.7% of the whole uh, uh, Brussels budget. 73.7%. And the only explanation is uh, they wanted to reconcile their partners with, um, with the new reality of, of a unified Germany. This is what Ferguson meant when he talked of war of mutually agreed uh, uh, reparations. Otherwise, it wouldn't be. Well, later on, it, uh, Germans, Germany's net contribution uh, receded to 40%, then uh, uh, 30%. And in the next years, it will go up again because of Brexit. I mean, last year, no, for, for 2016, we have not yet the relevant figures. But for 2015, we have them. And in 2015, Britain was the second largest uh, contributor after Germany. You see how much money they, wa they uh, want to extract from the British now. Uh, that's, uh, they try to blackmail them, 50 billion or 70 billion, whatever. So it's all about money. They talk about values all the time, but they mean money. Or put it differently, when somebody uh, keeps talking about values, most of the time he wants to destroy other values and, and, and to uh, uh, discredit them. I mean, just to mention um, um, uh, something else. Uh, of course, uh, Europe c could exist without the EU and without uh, this kind of integration and without the euro, of course. Uh, you don't need a uh, transfer union. Uh, but this is Emmanuel Macron's idea. Uh, and he kept quiet during the elections in, um, uh, 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 during the uh, election campaign in Germany, but I'm absolutely sure after uh, the German elections on uh, September 24, I think, he will present his demands to Angela Merkel. Then he will present his, he wants a common uh, Eurozone budget, he wants an arrangement for uh, European national, uh, national debts and bank debts. In the Eurozone, we have 1,000 billion euros of non-performing loans, as they are called. Uh, very high level in Italy, for instance, in, Greek, in Greece also, of course, but it's 1,000. So the whole thing is still very shaky. And um, let me phrase it like this. Uh, Emmanuel Macron wants to sap Germany's financial, financial strength. This is exactly what will happen. How much the German government will concede, I don't know. We just have to see what happens. Now, in addition, there are the enormous debt claims of the German <coughs> Bundesbank under the Target II uh, transfer system. And this, it is complicated, but I have to mention it. And um, I'm going to simplify it a little bit. Um, but um, these Target II transfer, um, this transfer system, was no problem until 2010, when the euro crisis broke out. The figures were more or less flat. Then the, and I'm talking about the Bundesbank debt claims against the euro system, yeah? the debt claims. After the crisis, it went up strongly, 
then when the crisis seemed to vanish, it went down again. And now, it, this year, it uh, hit an all-time high of uh, more than 800 billion euros. 800 billion euros. And these debt claims, uh, which are of course liabilities of uh, the debtor countries, bear no interest whatsoever. They are not tradable. They cannot be exchanged uh, into real assets. They even lack a payback term. So wh what they are worth? Uh, in, in case the euro breaks up, they will be lost to an unknown extent. Um, and, and the Bundesbank will, uh, hmm, will have a problem. And by the way, the Netherlands, with their own uh, target two claims, are in a similar position. <coughs> now, by coming back to Germany, t target two, um, has the weird consequence that at least part of German exports are fan financed by Germany themselves. And secondly, that the current account surpluses create no real value, like in the 50s and, and 60s. In the 50s and 60s, we had the uh, Europäische Zahlungsunion, European Payment Union, and uh, the surpluses and the deficits of the others had to be settled in gold and dollar. And from this time uh, stem the, uh, the German gold reserves. Um, but you see, th this is a completely different uh, uh, accounting system. Um, normally, You, sh you should be able to buy for uh, 800 uh, billion euros, if that was possible, uh, gold. Uh, it's not possible, of course. There's n n not uh, this amount of gold available. You could even say that the euro prevents Germany from becoming rich. For instance, a German sovereign wealth fund, uh, of which I, I'm an advocate, is not feasible within the European framework. And I'm completely convinced that in the end, uh, the euro will, will have damaged all participants, uh, including France, albeit for different reasons. And uh, it, was, it was never introduced for economic reasons. It was a deal, a political deal between Kohl and Mitterrand, who traded uh, the French consent to uh, German re reunification um, with the abolishment of the Deutsche Mark. That is uh, the true story behind the Euro. Now, to conclude, you must believe me that I didn't want to indulge in German self-pity. Yeah? I just wanted to describe international relations as they are. Uh, and I also know that many things detrimental are self-inflicted, but this is a different story. And behind the curtain of ideology, uh, political formulas and propaganda, usually lurks the question of money. Yeah. The question of money, who pays, who profits, who is able to loot. My nations have no interests. And um, I really think that all these power plays uh, uh, and, and all these uh, silly wars, which, which still go on, yeah, are vain and infertile. And the sheer existence of superpowers and constructs like the EU yeah, or, or the Euro uh, are necessarily harmful to people and their freedom. Well, in Germany, have, we have a proverb which goes like this. If everybody sweeps, 
in front of his own door, the whole street stays clean. Thank you.